It's new and improved, and you can even cook your dinner on it. That's this week on Motoring 2003. Sends Motoring 2003 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, total car care, we do that. You know, you can't open the business section of a newspaper these days without seeing words like takeover and convergence. It's a sign of the times. And you know, the automobile industry is no different. Take the Ford Motor Company, for instance. Over the years, they have acquired names like Mazda, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Volvo, and Land Rover. Now, while these kind of deals can make people nervous, there's a positive side also, because in this case, these companies now have access to Ford's cash which hopefully will enable them to produce new and more improved products, something Jag, Mazda, and Volvo have done. Which brings us to Land Rover. Now, this company's been around since 1948. It's had its problems with reliability, and let's face it, their product is not exactly mainstream. But things started looking up when BMW bought the company, but then BMW bailed after four years, and in came Ford. The result? In this year alone, Land Rover has introduced the Freelander to North America, the new and improved Range Rover, and the vehicle that we're going to look at this week, the 2003 Discovery. Well, I was asked a couple of years or so ago to take a critical look at Discovery, the Series 2 as it was then, and determine what we needed to do to make the car better. Um, we took a, a look at all of the aspects of the Discovery and the American market in particular um, and there were three areas that we really wanted to focus on to make the vehicle more, more competitive and better for the customers. That was in the areas of performance, uh, vehicle dynamics and refinement and, and build quality. We made um, about 368 significant changes on the vehicle. Um, top of the list really was the engine. Uh, our latest JD Power's appeal survey really shows that Discovery is trailing really a, a, amongst the competition with regard to the general performance of the vehicle, its acceleration, the sound at idle, and, and the general refinement of the engine. Now, uh, that being number one, the 4.6 engine did what we wanted it to do. It gave us the power, it gave us the acceleration. The vehicle now accelerates 0 to 60 in 9.5 seconds, which is a significant improvement over the 4 litre previously on Discovery. Um, and it also, with packages of, of refinement, has given us the, the level of quietness and uh, idle, idle quality that we were looking for on the vehicle. We've modified significantly the, the braking system and to a minor extent the suspension system to improve both the braking and handling of the vehicle. And we've done a whole host of changes on refinement, both interior, exterior refinement packages to make the vehicle a lot more quieter, a lot more comfortable, a lot more sophisticated and feel a lot more, um, more sedan-like for, for our customers. Land Rover is all about off-road performance and off-road supremacy. Um, it is our DNA, it's what we're all about as Land Rover vehicles, it's why people buy our vehicles uh, above other vehicles. Um, they are distinctive in their looks, but very much more so they're distinctive in their performance and what they can do. When you look at Land Rover, back to its original times, the vehicle was really designed as a, a workhorse, and uh, the ideal principle of it was exactly to help people uh, after the post-World War II era to work on the farms, work at the various factories and so on. So the vehicle was built to have a very high load carrying capacity, a very strong four-wheel drive system to pull them through these undeveloped roads. And uh, basically uh, this philosophy and this idea always stayed with us. And we keep on building our vehicles today with the same principles of ruggedness, durability and longevity. Of course, in the upper crust, where you're looking at the uh, luxury end of it, we're getting more and more players. And uh, again, the clientele is growing. So this is good for us, is bringing more people to look at Land Rover as we move forward. 
And again, this refl is reflected in our sales. Year-over-year -year growth last month, for example, was in excess of 250%. So we're quite pleased by seeing the segment growing. Ford have uh, had a, a very good influence on us in, in a way with regard to having the capability for us to be able to make the investment to do the things that we need to do. Uh, we have invested um, what almost, well just over I think $290 million worth of investment into the production facilities at Soli Hill as part of the new Range Rover launch that has permeated through the whole of the business. It is a fully integrated uh, production assembly facility at Soli Hill in, in England. Um, and that affects all vehicles and the 2003 Discovery has also benefited from a lot of that investment we've put on site as well. We're always looking at bringing over the people that basically are, uh, want to place themselves in a different segment, I guess a signature of who they are. So it's not mainstream and we're not after the mainstream market. In essence, uh, we are after the specialty buyer. Quite rightly so, they expect the level of quality and refinement and performance very much like the car that they've just come out of. And, and that level of sophistication is what we've tried to embody into 2003 Discovery. And I think, really think we've achieved it this. You got a winner here? I think so. I think we've got a real winner here. Yeah. Macho, macho man. Hey, where's my sailor's hat? More later on Kenzie's Corner. And don't say I didn't warn you. The age of the road rocket is finally upon us. Acura has got the RSX, Honda the Civic SIR, Ford the Focus SVT, and of course Nissan has got the Sentra SER Spec V. Well, wanting to pip all of them to the post is Mazda, and this all-new Mazda Speed Protégé. And no, this is not the concept version. Rather, it's one of 250 that will be up for grabs in 2003. And yes, every single one of them will be painted this vibrant, spicy orange. With the interest in power and performance booming, the pocket rocket phenomenon is rapidly becoming a fact of life. This is leading many to the aftermarket and an abundant supply of go-faster bits and pieces. Mazda, however, sees this trend as a huge and potentially lucrative marketing opportunity. When the concept is company endorsed, it becomes more affordable and everything added to the car is covered for at least three years or 80,000 kilometers. The hallmark of a good suspension is one that balances handling with comfort. Now, as is obvious, this thing flies through the pylon, so it's got more than its fair share of handling. However, out on a broken road, it also brings comfort because it doesn't rattle your fillings loose. In other words, Mazda have got the handling the car cries out for and the comfort that I enjoy. The reason for the balanced performance is down to the work done by Racing Beat, a well-known Mazda tuner. The rework consists of specially tuned struts and dampers, higher rate springs, larger anti-roll bars at both ends, and a front strut brace that adds to the body's integrity. This lock keeps the oversized P215 45R 17-inch tires glued to the road where they do the best work. Understeer is benign and the response to steering input remarkably fast and predictable. The design really does prove that ride quality need not take a back seat to handling. As good as the suspension upgrades really are, it's under the hood that you find the masterpiece. This 2.0-litre twin cam produces 170 horsepower. However, when you drive it, it feels a lot more, and it boils down primarily to the use of the turbocharger and the 160 pound-feet of torque it dishes out at 3,500 RPM. Driving the vehicle, however, it dishes it out over a very broad range, making the car feel a lot faster than the numbers suggest it should be on paper. It really does do the whole thing justice. The two liter twin cams free revving power is down to an air to air intercooler and a large Garrett T25 turbo that force feeds the engine. The job of making it all work the way it does is credited to Callaway Cars, a company renowned for its work with some of the world's greatest supercars. While there is an early bout of turbo lag, the engine pulls exceptionally well once through 1200 or so RPM. 
From this point on, a slight whistle signals that the horses are starting to gallop. The nice part is that the work does not turn the engine into a temperamental little bugger, as it does the urban thing as well as it does a fast drag away from traffic lights. As well as all of the mechanical upgrades they've given this Mazda Speed Protégé, they've addressed items inside. You get a very nice set of seats, set of go-faster pedals, a shortened gear shift with short throws. You also get a two-tone leather steering wheel that's got a chunky feel. Then you get to the middle and it looks as though they forgot something. However, when you turn the key on, out comes a very serious radio and serious quite literally. Not only has it got 450 watts of power, seven speakers, and is MP3 and CD ready, it's also ready for serious satellite radio. That gives you 60 channels of CD quality music. You've gotta love that. Stopping power comes from a large set of European spec disc brakes and a decent anti-lock system. The stops are short and straight and the ABS stays out until needed. Again, those massive tyres help matters enormously. This Mazda Speed Protégé is a very tight package. Great handling, great engine, comfortable interior and a wonderful sound system. Indeed, it's got one big benefit over all of those slammed vehicles you see running around the road. Where most of the aftermarket add-ons void their warranty, when it comes to this Protégé, Everything you see, both underneath and inside, is covered by the warranty. And that really is a big advantage. Our Midas tip of the week concerns repairing punctured tires. There's a number of different repair procedures for repairing a punctured tire. Some involve a quick easy removal of the tire from the vehicle but not demounting of the tire. In other words, the plug is installed from the outside of the tire. Now the tire manufacturers almost to a one prefer that you remove the tire, inspect the inside of the carcass of the tire and if it's acceptable for repair, perform the repair, the puncture repair from the inside of the tire. Here's a perfect example of why they want you to do that. If you look at this tire, you can see that it's chafed severely all the way around this area. Right here where it says energy, you can see the letters are completely chewed away, almost a cheese grater type of effect. Now some people might think that that was done by curbing the tire, but if you turn it around, you can see the same evidence on the inside of the tire. And that's evidence that this tire was run completely flat or severely underinflated on a hot day. The tire gets a severe fold in it right here and it chafes the rubber away. It can do a lot of damage inside, the, inside of the tire, but if you remove the tire from the rim, you'll see evidence of that damage and you won't proceed with a repair, you'll replace the tire. If you ever see this chafe mark around the side of your tire before having it repaired, insist that it come off the rim for a thorough inspection of the inside of the tire before you go ahead with any kind of repair. That's your Midas tip of the week. depending on where they can price it. I think that'll be a big determinant of how it does well in the market. It's a combination of styling and performance. I mean, it's a simple formula, but it's been working for them and looks like it's going to continue to work for them. Land Rover Driving School was uh, started really for owners and non-owners of sport utility of Land Rovers, so the sport utility owners could come to the school and learn more about the techniques for off-roading, how to take their vehicles off-road safely, and maybe encourage them to take their vehicles off-road and kind of start to explore the capabilities of a four-wheel drive vehicle. Give a couple creepers on the pedal there, bring your car into position. Nice we also have a junior off-road school, which is actually for kids from the ages of about 5 through 12. And um, interestingly enough, we found that a lot of kids who would go out with their, because you can take your kids with you in the Land Rover driving school, were really interested in off-roading and, and wanted to have that same kind of experience. So we actually were able to work with Rebel Replicas to come up with some replica Land Rover vehicles that are electric powered and take kids on the mini jungle course, which goes over the same, same ty type of terrain as their parents would go through, but to scale. It's fun and stuff because you can go up a lot of hills 
and kind of wild. I'm 10 years old, and yeah, I, I can't wait to um, drive a car and go off roading. I think it's a way to get kids excited about being off-road and doing it in, in, a, in a responsible manner, and that's what's really important for the longevity of the sport. One thing about those small cars, they're easy on the pocketbook thanks to low maintenance. And speaking of maintenance, on the 2003 Discovery, all schedule maintenance over the length of the warranty is complimentary. After that, an oil change will cost you 500 bucks. Just kidding. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Brad, that's a great idea that Land Rover's got. I mean, think about it. They've just eliminated one major reason why their vehicle could give their client problems. If it wasn't maintained properly, something was overlooked or a fluid level wasn't checked or topped up with the correct fluid, they're going to do it at their place and do it right. So they've eliminated one potential area of problems. It's a really great idea. Anyhow, we want to read some email this week from one of our viewers, uh, Adam Biffin. He's got a 99 Cavalier with 22,000 kilometers. He said that uh, the brakes seemed to squeak, so I took it in for a checkup and was told that my front rotors and pads needed replacement due to rust buildup on the top of the rotor. Uh, cost of about $400. He found this hard to believe with the low mileage. The brakes feel fine. What would you suggest I do? First of all, let's explain why these front brake rotors or brake rotors on vehicles in general can get this terrible rust buildup. Remember that the brake rotor is an iron part that's underneath the vehicle, gets all kinds of road splash, has a pretty tough life ahead of it and it in most cases can't be protected by paint or lubricants or rust preventive it's just a slab of iron underneath your vehicle now this one here came off a Cavalier a couple years older than our viewers Cavalier but it'll do for our explanation because the rotors on those cars were the same on Cavaliers Grand Ams, Sunfires, etc. for many years. Now this particular brake rotor has a great surface finish on both sides. No reason for it to even be resurfaced or replaced for that reason. But it's got a big rust buildup in the veins that cool the brake rotor. It's completely plugged with rust. If you look around this area here, you can see all kinds of rust and scale dropping off it as I move it. And that's reason for replacing that part. Now he talked about rust buildup on the top edge of the rotor and you can see that this one has a slight amount there and it starts to creep its way across the, fit, the surface of the rotor, the area that the pads uh, work against on the rotor. And remember that it's the usage, the uh, scrubbing action or the friction of the brake pads scrubbing this iron part clean all the time that keeps it clean while it's in surface. Now <clears throat> when you park the car for an extended period of time, and it doesn't have to be all that long if you're around the Great Lakes, near the coast, or anywhere where the relative humidity is high, this iron part can corrode or rust very quickly. If you're out in the prairies, you don't have as much of a problem. But it, believe me, around the Great Lakes, you get a lot of corrosion on these parts, and a lot of times you have to replace the rotor at every brake job on a, on a car like that. Now on this other rotor, you can see that the rust creeping in from the edge is very extensive. It's extremely wide, it's broken, and that is just way too much to be acceptable. When I flip it over, you can see that this side of the rotor has narrowed right up from, from the outboard and inboard sides with corrosion. That gouges out your brake pad, wears it out prematurely, and it'll cause a lot of harshness and roughness in the pedal. If you keep your vehicle garaged or parked inside where it's kept dry, you can minimize this. That'll help. But if the vehicle isn't driven on a regular basis, you don't get that scrubbing action, so you've got to drive it to scrub off that corrosion. Getting back to his question, what would you suggest I do? You've got to rely on the technician that actually looked at the car. I'm not there to look at the car. You've got to go with that person's input. If they think the rust is too extensive, then probably replacing the brake rotors and the pads is a good idea. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2003. Our cameraman, you, you can't see him because he's behind the camera, was telling me today about a TV commercial he saw recently, a bunch of guys at a gym, and they're pumping the weights, and they're riding the bikes, and the muscles are bulging, and the sweat's pouring off them, and the girls are all looking at them going, ooh, wow. And then the voice comes on the PA system. Well, the owner of the blue minivan, please go to your vehicle, your headlights are on. And one of the guys looks a little furtive, but he keeps riding his bike. The voice comes on again. 
Well, the owner of the blue minivan, please go to your vehicle. Your headlights are on. So the guy kind of looks sheepish. He gets off his bike and he walks away. And the girls are all going, ugh, minivan driver. I'm thinking, why do minivans have this kind of image? I don't understand it. I mean, the marketing guys keep telling us that you got to drive a big SUV, preferably with enough lights on the roof to play night baseball, to prove that you're a macho, rough, tough, studly, frontier, outdoors type of guy. Or you got to buy a 400 horsepower sports car to prove that you're a studly, rough, tough, race car driving type of guy. The guy in a minivan with a boatload of kids on board, he's proven he's a macho guy. He's got the proof right behind him. I mean, it's sort of like walking into a bar trying to pick up a chick and showing them a picture of your family and say, sweetheart, you got a 50% chance of having a kid that looks as good as that. It doesn't work, but it probably should. So you minivan drivers, there's no reason for you to be ashamed. There's no reason for you to think that people think you're boring. You've proven that you can make it happen. So walk tall and drive proud. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, one of the pleasures of summertime is being able to barbecue. Maybe put a little shish kebab on foil, wrap it up, and place it on your engine's manifold. In this case, the manifold of the new Discovery, as was suggested by Land Rover. Well, after driving for about an hour and a half, we have the final dish here. Let's taste it. You know, that's not bad. But you know what? You're probably asking yourself, why would you want to do this? Well, believe it or not, some guy has put out a book on actually cooking on the manifold. Some people have much, much too much time on their hands. Well, I've only had a brief time behind the wheel of the new Discovery, but I'll tell you something. Earlier, they told us there was 386 changes made to this vehicle, and I'll tell you right now, the top of the list is that new V8 engine. Huge improvement, and the vehicle just handles that much better. But of course, Graham will have a closer look at the new Discovery on a future test drive. Make sure you join us for that as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. They were primarily made for the dairy industry, but they were used for inner city delivery of everything. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of them around now because they weighed 6,300 pounds, so when scrap was high, they were the first thing that went to the scrap yard. TSN's Motoring 2003 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that.